Yeah. So, welcome. Thank you uh, all for coming on this very special occasion uh, of the launch of the great crisis of capitalism. <laughs> Some years ago, I was in uh, Asia. We had theatre circuits in Asia. And the doom and the gloom of the Asian crisis, you had to have lived through it to understand how bad it was. And in particular in Korea, where they cancelled all flights in and out of Australia, and people were literally suicided. But what happened in the Asian crisis? We sailed through it because we had a great treasurer. <laughs> and, and then we had the global financial crisis. And in my humble view, um, we also did damn well through the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis, because we were healthy and strong. And again, a great man. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Peter Costello AC. Uh, and I'll get out of here. Well, thank you very much to Graham Burke and to Robin and to Village Roadshow for, for having us here at the Gold Class Cinemas on this great occasion. And uh, I did ask Graham why it was that we were launching this book here in a Gold Class <laughs> Cinema. <laughs> and he said to me, because he's got first rights on this book for the movie production. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm looking forward to the movie even more uh, than reading the book. Uh, I don't know who's going to play, uh, play you, Peter. Uh, George Clooney, I think, will be playing uh, Peter Jones uh, in the years which lay ahead. But I want to say to Peter and to Libby uh, and to our publishers what, uh, what a great pleasure it is to launch this book, The Great Crises of Capitalism. Uh, the stock market crash comes along at least once a generation. Uh, we had a stock market crash in 2008. And uh, before that, we had a huge one, of course, in 1987, Black Monday, October the 19th, 1987. Still the largest one-day fall on the uh, American stock market uh, ever recorded, greater, in fact, than any one day in 1929 or in the... Uh, recession or depression that followed it. Uh, we had a, a, a mini collapse in 2001 when uh, tech stocks uh, collapsed, uh, subsequently became known as the tech wreck in the, uh, 2001. And there's a reason why we had a stock market crash uh, every generation or so, uh, because every generation believes it's invincible. Uh, every generation believes that the future will be different under its control. Every generation watches the stock market begin to accelerate uh, and believes it's a one-way bet and as people join and join a stock market rise it of course becomes self-fulfilling and uh, everybody believes it'll go on uh, forever right until it crashes. And the crash reminds us that there's no such thing as a one-way bet on a stock market, that every boom uh, uh, will end in a bust and we need to have such a stock market uh, correction once in a generation because otherwise our financial advisors and our stock brokers and our fund managers would really think they are invincible. Uh, <laughs> they, they themselves are creating all of uh, this wealth which is being accumulated on the stock markets. Uh, and this book is not about stock market crashes so much as uh, the cycle that uh, we see in the economy. Uh, I can remember at the early part of the 2000s, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, literature which was being published on, uh, on how we were moving into a new economy or a new age. Uh, some serious economic literature on, on how the business cycle had been defeated and people had all sorts of theories about that. Uh, one theory was uh, that uh, improvements in information, communications and technology meant that the allocation of capital was more efficient than ever before. Uh, some argued that uh, the dot-com revolution had unleashed a new wave of productivity which had been unknown in human history before. Some said that the availability of information meant that there was instantaneous feedback into markets which could never overprice in the way they had uh, in the past. Uh, and of course all of that triumphalist uh, literature ended in the crash of uh, 2008 
uh, which reminded us uh, yet again that markets habitually overvalue and need to correct. Uh, now, there's been a lot of work uh, done on this, and this is uh, a tome uh, which is part of that work uh, on why it is uh, that you have this inherent instability uh, in capitalism. Karl Marx uh, thought that there was an inherent instability in capitalism which would lead eventually uh, to the defeat of the capitalist system. Uh, but Peter Johnson is no Marxist. Uh, <laughs> 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 This time is different, uh, the purpose of which is to show that this time is, uh, is not different. Uh, uh, say that uh, they found 14 banking crises since the 1970s, 250 sovereign debt defaults since the 1980s, uh, and uh, a couple hundred bouts of hyperinflation uh, in the post-World World War II world. Uh, the highest of which was uh, the Greek currency collapse in 1944. Uh, which put inflation at 30 billion percent, uh, which makes uh, Zimbabwe's current uh, half a billion percent inflation rate look quite moderate. Uh, and of course, what uh, happened in 2008, uh, particularly in the United States and Britain, was uh, a banking crisis. Um, I don't use the word global financial crisis. Uh, I, I don't think that's precise enough. I think it was a, a banking crisis, particularly an American banking crisis. When the Americans have a banking crisis, they like to call it a global crisis because in their view, if it's in the United States, it, it must be global. But of course, Australia had no banking crisis in 2008. None of our major financial institutions um, ran out of liquidity. Uh, none of our institutions looked like they would fail. Uh, in fact, no major Australian bank made one quarter of loss. Not one quarter of loss by any major Australian bank in 2008. And that was because our banks, in my view, were well run. We had a dedicated prudential regulator. It insisted on adequate capital controls to back lending. We didn't drop credit standards. Our housing market was resilient, supported by strong employment and strong terms of trade. And most importantly, uh, we weren't buying products from the American system, i.e. lending to the Americans. We were borrowing from the Americans, uh, which was, uh, for once in our lifetime, uh, a very good thing. Uh, <laughs> we were in international financial markets. Now, you may say, um, that had nothing to do with Australia surviving the banking crisis of 2008. Uh, that we survived the banking crisis of 2008 because uh, we invested in insulation bats and school halls. <laughs> <laughs> that is an alternative uh, to being put around by uh, the side of politics other than me. Uh, but I make this point to you that um, a lot of that stimulus, of course, is still going on. Every day as I drive to work, I drive past my local primary school, which has this big building, which is <laughs> under construction, and a sign which says, um, uh, economic stimulus package. Yeah. And it's a very strange thing that spending that's going up now is insulating us against a downturn in 2008. Uh, some might have thought that 2008 had passed, and maybe the stimulus was now unnecessary, but apparently not. Now what uh, this book uh, reminds us of is that banking crises, stock market crises, uh, booms and busts have been perennial features of the capitalist system. And Peter takes us back to the tulip boom of 1636, the South Sea bubble of 1720, the days of marvellous Melbourne in the 1890s and of course uh, the crash of the 1920s. And I think Peter's view would be um, uh, perhaps the same as my view, but a view well crystallised by Irving Kristol, who, uh, when he gave up being uh, a liberal in America and became a conservative, or a neo-conservative, wrote a book called Two Cheers for Capitalism. 
Now, it's not a perfect system, but it's better than the alternatives of which are on offer. Um, now, there's another way of reading Peter's book. You can read it to find out who he likes and who he dislikes. <laughs> Peter is what we would call an inflation hawk. He says, inflation introduces many costs into an economy. Inflation erodes the value of people's assets. It raises the cost of living. It makes contracts difficult to adjust and in some cases impossible to enforce. Inflation makes planning investments more uncertain. And if you actually read Henry Thornton, you'll find that Henry Thornton is even more of inflation than Peter uh, Johnson is. Now, how do I read this book to find out who he likes and who he doesn't like? Well, um, the first thing you read, and it comes as a bit of a shock, is that um, Peter worked to elect Gough Whitlam in uh, the 1970s, which is very honest of you to say so. <laughs> couldn't figure out how he won an election because not many people claim to have been on his side. <laughs> Peter tells us that as a young economist, he cheered on Milton Friedman in, uh, in London. Um, but he also tells us that he doesn't like conservatives throwing off at Keynes, who he still considers uh, to have the best analysis of uh, the recession of the 19. 20s and 1930s. Uh, Peter ends the book by calling for a supranational currency backed by a global central bank. I must say to you, um, Peter, I agree with you on neither of those propositions. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you should read books. Uh, controversial books are the best books. Uh, one, I don't trust global institutions because I think they're subject to political influences even worse than national ones. And secondly, I do not believe in the existence of the perfect bureaucrat. <laughs> um, I do not believe in perfect national bureaucrats and I do not believe in perfect international ones. Um, let me let you into a secret. Central bankers are fallible. Um, I know because I appointed a few of them. <laughs> uh, they are people that are working with the best available information, but they can make mistakes. So the idea that an international bureaucrat could run a, a monetary policy suitable for all nations of the world, including small countries like ours, uh, I find um, uh, quite... Um, uh, uh, stretches my credulity, but um, in a moment Peter will convince you as to why it's right. <laughs> um, central bankers do get things uh, wrong. I think in our country, our central bank, uh, for example, uh, was right to tighten monetary policy from 2002 on, <coughs> to lean into an asset burden, uh, something which um, you recommend, uh, but it didn't know when to stop. Uh, it was still tightening monetary policy as late as March of 2008, after the subprime collapse, uh, after Bear Stearns, uh, and within months of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Uh, if monetary policy works on a 12 or 18 month lag, they were wrong decisions. Um, I'd make the same uh, point in relation to the late 1980s. Um, it was right to tighten monetary policy which eventually reached 17.5%. But it was wrong to keep it going uh, as late as 1990, when we were already on the eve um, of a great recession. Uh, and uh, inflation hawks believed uh, that we should have kept uh, interest rates higher longer in, the, in early 1990. For example, when rates began to be cut, uh, both the then shadow treasurer and the shadow finance minister who were John Hewson and John Stone, criticised uh, the decisions to cut rates in early 1990. They criticised them because they believed monetary policy should have been tighter. Um, they were right to criticise, but they were on the wrong grounds. Monetary policy should have been loosened uh, far earlier than in fact it was, and we know that from the recession of the 1990s. So central bankers are not infallible. Let me let you into another secret. 
uh, secretaries to the Treasury are not infallible. Uh, uh, they are people who are doing the best with the limited information that they have, which is by no, no means perfect. Uh, I'm going to end up by reading a, uh, uh, a quote uh, from uh, uh, the Financial Times, which I thought Peter, for one, um, would really like. Uh, and it's written by uh, Alan Greenspan. It's in yesterday's. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was in yesterday's uh, paper, and he was um, he was actually criticising the new regulations in the United States. But he said this: the problem is that uh, regulators, uh, far from having all information that they need, have just a glimpse into the internal workings of the global financial system. Today's competitive markets, uh, whether we seek to recognise it or not, are driven by an international version of the invisible hand that is unredeemably opaque. That's quite nice. Um, Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand. Um, he said it was invisible. We don't quite know how it operates. It's, it's there. <coughs> Uh, Greenspan said, not only is it invisible, but it's unredeemably opaque. Uh, which is an interesting way of thinking of those trillions of people, trillions of decisions by billions of people in trillions of transactions that are actually going into the international economy. Um, you could try and control and command their decisions. Uh, but it doesn't work. Or you could learn to live with it, with all of its triumphs and its disasters, and try and put some principles around it, <coughs> like prudential stability, like buyer beware, like the requirement to make full disclosure. But history tells us that's a better outcome than the alternative. Uh, we won't be able to control it. It's irredeemably opaque. We can put some principles around it. And we can try and harness it for the better livelihoods of all of the people who work under that irredeemably opaque system of markets signaling <coughs> backwards and forwards to each other. Now, if you want to know more about the great crises of capitalism, if you want to know whether they can be solved and how they can be solved, we have our author here, uh, Peter Johnson. It's uh, on sale. Uh, you can buy a copy uh, as you uh, come out. And when you're um, sitting in the next boring movie, uh, which would not be shown at Village Roadshow, <laughs> and you want to spruik up and get some excitement, you can pull out your book. Great advice. <laughs> <laughs> By Peter Johnson, I wish you every success. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter Costello, for those kind and critical words, which I will answer shortly. <laughs> Graham and Robin, what a wonderful place to have a party. And now that I've seen the these, this movie in blue light advertises forthcoming movies, you should <laughs> I've heard it from the man himself. I'll be very happy to uh, make advice on the move. Now, as to this World Central Bank, I am slightly provoked <laughs> that you would be the governor. <laughs> 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 Billion dollar salary. Oh, I'm not real <laughs> but uh, there's one point that you missed, and I couldn't have made it quite clear enough. Part of the plan is to have this money for their billion dollar salaries, just increasing the base money by five percent per annum. They're not allowed to change from that, and then every other currency has got a choice: it can be inflationary, or it can link to the base money. So that's the little bit that was missing. And when you've got that little bit, it all works. And it actually doesn't require Costello and Johnson to run it. You just have a little equation.
asked me to figure out what the problem was, and I figured out how to fix it, and you know, we fixed it. But of course, when you float the forward brake, you put pressure on the spot brake. And of course, we were really working towards a flexible exchange rate. Well, then, of course, Mr. Hawk won, and we had the new treasurer, Paul Kenny. And for a while, I thought it was a good bloke. <laughs> and do you remember at the, the weekend of the election that Hawk won? Three billion dollars had gone out of the country in the week leading up to it. We had to decide what to do about the currency, and we recommended they cut it by 10 percent. And next week, three billion dollars came back. <laughs> now you do the maths. Over a weekend, the speculators made speculators made 300 million dollars. And I used to say to Keegan every chance I got, "Mate, you're a, you're a Labor treasurer. Do you really want?" the taxpayers to lose 300 million and the speculators to gain it. You float the currency, that'll be fixed. And he did in the end, which was terrific. <laughs> but of course, I, I was then right about something that Keating was wrong about and I was never forgiven and that ended that career and I had to go and some serious money. And work with that. <laughs> Graham Burke. <laughs> and it's been fantastic. Um, but I wanted to thank a few people it wasn't just me fixing things up back in the 80s. Ross Garner was there, and I'm really glad he said bullshit on national television yesterday because it needed to be said. <laughs> Boris Shedman, where are you, Boris? Boris's book on the um, on Australia and the Great Depression is a masterpiece, and Boris and, like Ross, helped a lot with this. Jeff Blaney, hell. What a, what a contribution he's made, and he went through it and fixed a few things up. And the, the chapter heading I like best is Marvellous Melbourne and its astonishing property boom and bust. And Jeff contributed that that time. You, you never knock back a suggestion from Jeff Blaine. Um, Stuart McIntyre, who apologises, he's apparently had a vice regal invitation tonight that he couldn't turn down. I don't know what they're doing at Government House. Plotting, I suppose. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Thanks, Mum. Well, Gary McIntyre's a very different person. Yeah. <laughs> Stuart, Stuart, went through, Stuart went through the draft four times and beat me up four times. Um, but he's, he says it's okay now. Um, <laughs> You know, every author worth his salt, or her salt, is schizophrenic to some extent. <laughs> and I've put my multiple personalities on the front cover. <laughs> and that was Stuart's doing, because he has discerned that when I'm in my Henry Thornton mode, I'm a little bit bolder and more of an inflation ball. <laughs> By the way, the other thing I said about inflation, Peter, is this inflation is there. And it's people in government stealing things. And to your <laughs> Politicians are awful. <laughs> 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 uh, that's great. Uh, so, I want to thank Libby, who's unstinting support, but also amazingly sharp criticism. <laughs> saved, saved me from a lot of problems. You know, being married to a woman with a a steel trap for a mine. <laughs> it's not always comfortable. <laughs> but it's always a lot of fun. <laughs> um, David, um, who's for doubling as a photographer tonight, um, David did the index and the technical glossary, and Nick Mellon, who's here too, um, did the graphs. And um, can I commend Anthony Capello and his production team. I think it looks really swish, whatever the contents. <laughs> As you walk in, you go on class, touching your copy, people will think you're really someone. Peter <laughs> <laughs> Costello has done a pretty good job of summarising my views, and I thank him for that. But I am going to put them in the order in which I have them because there's a really important point that even Peter's missed. <laughs> there are three really important conclusions. One, the economics profession has not yet nailed the Great Depression and why a big, a big drop in asset prices could, could, should cause a Great Depression. 
Now, I've spoken to some of the world's depression economists about this, and they agree with me. And I'm hoping someone will do the work. And there's a reason why that's very important. Secondly, since America's become an inflationary country, which happened when dear old Richard Nixon cut the link to gold, financial crises have become larger and more frequent. And in fact, if you're an engineer looking at the graph, you'd say it's actually out of control and heading for serious trouble. And three, we are facing two big risks. The first risk is that we'll regulate everything out of existence, extremely the gold and goods. The second risk is we won't fix it. We won't fix the design faults. And these bigger and bigger financial crises will one day end in a really hard crash that we won't be able to stop turning into depression because we don't know how to do that. So they're, they're the, three, um, the three big points and there's a bit of a contradiction there. And what I try to do is come up with a set of regulations that are more sensible. They're basically libertarian because that's how I am. But they put some essential state safeguards into the system. And the last point I would make is about monetary policy in this global central bank that Costello's going to run and I'm going to subvert from below. Um, China has figured this out. Now, when I went through the 19th century, there's a chapter on that. What was amazing was the Bank of England and the gold standard actually worked. So I thought about this and thought we could have a modern gold standard. I could see Hugh Morgan agrees with this. And we have, a, we have a bundle of commodities, probably include uranium and platinum and stuff like that. And this central bank would have to just keep it growing at 5% per annum. That would fix the inflation problem once and for all. And you know what? Having figured that out, I discovered the people of China think that. And in fact, there's a lot in the newspapers about why won't the Chinese let their currency go up and all that stuff. The real battle's over exactly that issue. See, after the Second World War, the Americans said, I don't care what the rest of you guys think, we won the war, so we're going to have the dollar as the global currency. But the Americans have become inflationists, sadly, led by currency, led by Mr. Bernanke. And think about this. China's already America's banker. What if it turns out that it's the right of America on monetary policy? That's going to be wonderful. Carl Marx, you'll be spinning in his growth. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I've only got one more bit of advice. Uh, buy early or buy often. <laughs> lots of people you can give this book to, and they will love it. As Peter says, they can take it to the movies and. Um, Read it with a little torch. <laughs>